This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. What I'm going to share today is actually going to take two sessions to share, or when we break it up for television, it'll take four. And it's entitled, The Passover, The Lamb of God, and The Scroll of Destiny. Or we can just simply subtitle it, Follow the Lamb. You want to find out what God's doing? You got to follow the Lamb. I want to start today in Genesis 3.15. We all know this. You know, there are some that say that there's not mysteries yet to be revealed. They don't understand the dynamic of God. There are a lot of things that God has hidden until the appointed time to be revealed. We see this with the life and the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. How do many know that that was a mystery to the enemy? The Word says that if they had known they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And so you're in this strategic war with God. The Nehesh in the garden gets Adam and Eve to sin and be infused with the iniquity force. And he thinks it's checkmate. Yet when God go, comes on the scene, he gives a promise to Eve. And he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her seed, your seed and her seed. And you shall bruise his head, or he shall, or, and he shall bruise your head, or literally in the Hebrew it says, crush his head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now I want you to imagine for a moment what was going through the gates of hell in the council of darkness. What just happened? I thought we had got it checkmate. We just got a source to empower the kingdom of darkness because as man would, would continue to multiply and his descendants would yield to the iniquity force, it literally becomes a river of darkness that the enemy can pull from to funnel and empower their entire kingdom. So here the devil's thinking, I've turned humanity into Duracell batteries to fund what I'm doing in this war against God, and it is checkmate because God caused them to proliferate. Something angels could not do. That's why there's no such thing as a female angel. They're all male. God never created a counterpart for them to be able to have children. And that's why it sets a desecration of what we see in Genesis chapter 6. And so he's thinking, what am I going to do? Is it going to be this woman? We progress a little bit further and find out that she has two sons, Cain and Abel. Abel draws from the knowledge that which is God is giving and gives the appropriate sacrifice. Cain, on the other hand, chooses to draw from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil and decide for himself what's an appropriate sacrifice. And in doing so, he declared, I will be able to draw from Gnostic knowledge and I will prepare my own way of salvation. He becomes the first priest of the kingdom of darkness, the, the mystery religions. 
And Lucifer puts it in his heart and he slays his brother. Thinking, okay, I just got rid of her good seed. Not understanding the mystery of what God was doing. It was hidden from hell, and aren't you glad? There are still things, I think, the enemy today, as he reads the book of Revelation, it is still hidden from him. He can't make sense of it. And I might add today that a lot of preachers read the book of Revelation, and they can't make sense of it. You know, we go to conferences, and we got Carl Gallup and, and all these guys there, and one of the running jokes is, you know, in the book of Revelation, there's this 30 minutes in heaven that there's silence. And that's provided so that everybody can adjust their eschatological charts, because we all got it wrong. There is not recorded that the silence broke, and one guy goes, "Woohoo! I got it right, my chart's right. No, we were all wrong. Because only until it begins to unfold do we with great clarity understand that which is God is doing. It has to be revealed by His Spirit. So let's go a little bit further. God promises it. It wasn't Abel. It wasn't Abel. I'm not going to get into Genesis 6 or Genesis 11 this morning. I'm going to go into Genesis 22. There was a guy named Abraham that... Oh yeah, I do got to touch on Genesis 11. Can I do that for a moment? The Tower of Babel. The proper interpretation of Deuteronomy. When Moses was retelling it, he said the nations were divided up according to the B'nai Elohim, the sons of God. Then it goes on to list 70 descendants of Noah. And that's where we get the concept of 70 nations. The Talmud says 72, which is drawn out of the mystery religions. And so God says, you wanted to follow these things? Have at it. He basically washed his hands of mankind and said, you want to follow these principalities and powers and rulers of darkness? They will become your gods. But he said, I'm going to have a heritage come out of it. And there was one man living in Babylon. Not only was he living in Babylon... His family's occupation were making the idols of Babylon. Can you imagine growing up, he was learning how to make Molech and Dagon and all the other ons and, and all this stuff, and he was an expert in crafting of the gold and the stone, and because one day his father wanted to turn that over to him for him to take, to take charge of the family business. I remember listening to Miles Monroe and he was saying there, Abram was worshiping among all these God statues. He's going, home, home. And then all of a sudden, Abram, huh? <laughs> you know? And God introduces himself and says, I'm the only one true God. And I'm calling you out of Babylon. Leave mother, leave father, just, just get up and go. Isn't that our call? When we hear Jesus call us name, by name? You see, when we accept Jesus and make him the Lord and Savior of our life, that call is to come out of Babylon. Just That's why the Apostle Paul looked at Abram and said, man, now is he a template for Israel? He's a template for the Gentiles. Let me give, it, let me give you this. Uh, how many know that Abram did not start out as a Hebrew? He was a Gentile pagan. When he crossed over the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, when he crossed over the rivers and came out of Babylon, he became a Hebrew because a Hebrew means to cross over. He crossed over, shook the dust off his feet, and said, I'm going to follow this God that I heard, that told me, that came to me. He's not like the idols. He came and he spoke to me and said, I am El Shaddai. I am the only true God. And the first revelation that Abram had of God was, was God reveals himself by his names. Why did he reveal himself as El Shaddai? 
because he was leaving everything that he knew. He was leaving his family wealth. He was leaving uh, the positions they had and everything, and he left it all. And God was saying, you don't need Babylon. I wish Christians would hear that today. We do not need Babylon. God is more than enough. He is still El Shaddai in our lives. But the further that Abram got away from Babylon, the greater the provision became. Oh, that'll preach for a week. The further he got away from Babylon, the greater God revealed himself as El Shaddai. Now he's an old man. God had given him the son of promise, even when they had given up and, and he ended up having Ishmael by, his, by a handmaiden that he brought out of Egypt with his wife, for his wife, trying to help God. How many know when God has a redemptive plan, you don't need to help him, you're just along for the ride. When we try to help God, we always get into trouble. But Isaac was born, and now he's a young, strapping young man, and God comes to him and says, I want you to go up into this particular place, and I want you to offer sacrifice for me. And so they pack up the wood, they pack up their servants, and they go on this journey. And we pick up here in, in Genesis 22 and 1. And now it came to pass after these things, the Lord, the, that God tested Abraham. This, you know, the they have the thing where, don't worry, this is only a test, you know, when they have the national broadcasting thing. When God does a test, it is pivotal in your life. When we are tested of God, there are no do-overs. King Saul was tested of God, and when he failed, his lineage was set aside, and David's lineage replaced it because he failed the test. We need to take the testing of God seriously. And this, was, this is crucial in redemptive history, this test of God, because it set the stage for redemption, and it set the stage in a way the enemy could not even comprehend. That God tested Abram and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, underline that in, your word, in the word, because he was the son of promise. He was the only son of promise in Abraham's life. So here he goes to the mountain with his only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as, and offer him there as a burnt offering uh, on one of the mountains of which I will tell thee. So God just told him, I want you to go, I want you to take Isaac, this one that you believed all these years, and I want you to offer him up as a burnt offering. Wow. I don't have time this morning to get into that the seeds of this redemption and victory was already planted before the birth of Isaac, when after he won the, with the army of the four kings that took Sodom and Gomorrah, that when Melchizedek showed up, he showed him the mystery, the blood and the wine. That did something in the heart of Abraham. The book of Isaiah says that when he was going to take him up, that he was, that he, in a vision, he knew God would raise that boy from the ashes. Resurrection. Resurrection had never happened in the history of mankind up to that time. So he was going to believe in something that had never happened before that no one else ever had a comprehension of. But God's testing him. Now I'm going to jump to verse 7. They get there. And but Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Then look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And all of a sudden, out of his mouth, Abram begins to prophesy. He didn't turn to him and said, son, you're the lamb. Bah. He didn't do that. 
And Abram said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. You need to underline that in your Bible. That was prophetic because there was an offering that one day God himself would do and that lamb could not be provided by any man. It had to be provided by the hand of God himself. And that was prophesied by Abraham. In fact, a true shofar is not these long Yemenite shofars. They actually developed those, although they're kosher and you can use them. It was out of envy that the, that the priests had these long silver trumpets, so they wanted something big along, so you get these that sound like love boat horn every time you do it. But a true horn is a ram's horn. Okay? Because I want to jump down and I want to show you something. Where do I want to start? Verse, uh, verse 9. And then they came to the place which God had told them. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took, the, and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel Lord called unto him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Now, when you understand covenant, covenant is when a lesser comes into covenant with one that is greater. That's the nature of covenant. And it was a blood covenant that Abram had established with Almighty God. That there were sacrifices that were were slain and, and laid into and they walked among them. God literally came down as a pillar of fire and walked through them with Abram. And in blood covenant, let's say Brother Michael and I entered into blood covenant. Everything that he has now becomes mine, and everything that I have now becomes his. That I will raise up, if if someone attacks him, I will raise up in his defense no matter what it costs me. But there's an aspect of covenant few people realize, that if I ask something of him, I've got to be willing to do the exact same thing. You never ask someone in covenant that which you are unwilling to do yourself. Here is a man of faith that walked out of Babylon, that followed God and got the son of promise, his only son Isaac, and he was willing to offer his own son on the altar for God, and it opened the door for God to offer his only son for humanity. And out of his own lips, he was saying, God will provide himself a lamb. Now we go on in the story. Verse 13, and then Abram looked, lifted his eyes and looked. And there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up on for burnt offering instead of his son, And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide her, Yahweh Jireh. And it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Guys, underline that in your Bible. Now, I'm an old Baptist charismatic, and I remember that, you know, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, he's going to give me a whole bunch of stuff, much stuff, much stuff. That's not even what this is talking about. Yahweh Jireh does not speak of the gold in your pocket, the clothes on your back, or the house over your head. It was a declaration that God will provide for himself a lamb in that mount. That mount, not another mount. Right there on that exact same spot that Abraham was going to offer up Isaac right 
there, God was going to provide himself a lamb. Now, God provides a ram, and it's from that ram's horn. Whenever you hear a shofar blown properly, it sounds like a cry. A cry for what? For the lamb to come. That is a declaration. A lamb will come. This was a ram. It was not a lamb. Oh, I don't know about you, but I'm excited. All this is going on. Now, my friend Carl Koch can take apart the Hebrew. I mean, the brother snores Hebrew, okay? And he can actually take this apart in Hebrew. And literally in the Hebrew, it says that when Abram looked up at the angel and, and he looked over, Carl will take apart the Hebrew and say that he saw the cross. And it was at that moment that Abraham was saved. What a pivotal point in history. And you think your life doesn't matter. One man came out of Babylon when nobody else would because God spoke to him and trusted God. And because of that, he opened up the door of salvation for all of humanity. You see, we need to learn. This, this is my notes. I'm gonna, we need to learn to look beyond ourselves. What God may be doing in your life right now may prepare the way for what he wants to do in your children and your grandchildren and your children's children if the Lord tarries. We have become so self-absorbed that we forget that when we walk with God, we're laying a foundation that the next generation can stand on. Powerful stuff. Now I want to fast forward. God told Abraham, he said, listen, there's going to come a time that your children aren't going to follow me. They're going to turn from me. And when they do, he said, there's bondage coming. He said, one day they're going to end up in Egypt and they're going to forget me. But I'm going to bring them out. We find there was a famine in the land. We know about Joseph, how that he, was, that he was able to interpret dreams and knew that there was a famine coming, seven years of preparing. Seven, one of the things that seven represents is absolute. There was absolute bounty right before there was absolute famine. And the Pharaoh under Joseph grew and ended up owning all of Egypt. Became extremely prosperous. Then a Pharaoh rose up that they didn't know. God's people ended up becoming slaves. In the nine plagues, guys, God not only judged the gods of Egypt, he stripped the land of all the prosperity that Joseph had brought to it. Because they wouldn't recognize Abraham's descendants and they wouldn't properly recognize the God that they walked with. But now the Pharaoh says, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill all your firstborn sons in the morning. And Moses said, man, you just set the template for what's getting ready to happen. And he says, here's what we're going to do. God's getting ready to pass over. That when he judges Egypt, which is another type and shadow of the world, when he judges Egypt, no judgment will come to the home that has the Passover lamb's blood over the doorpost. You know, I tell my friends, they're those, all those that are pre-tribbers, and, and we, we can do this in love because we respect one another and know that we're all looking through a glass darkly, is if you're not right, and it goes into the tribulation period, the only way to survive is making sure that the blood is over the doorpost while the whole world is following after the Antichrist. It's a time of great testing. And you know what the ultimate test is during the tribulation period? The ultimate test is not taking the mark. Whatever it is, but to remain faithful to God. But now we see here in Exodus 12, 13, 
Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial. It is a moadim. It is a divine rehearsal. Because looking back at what God has done prepares us for what God is going to do. Aren't you glad God tells us the end from the beginning? This is not a guessing game. In the end, Jesus wins, just like Pharaoh went down, just like all the different things that we see in redemptive history. He's got it planned out. He's already lived it. God's already done it. And the enemy is always playing catch up. And you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, and you shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. And so it was at that moment, just a crack, just, a, just an opening of what God was going to do. You see, with the lamb, they had to find a spotless lamb without spot nor blemish. They didn't, they didn't bring God the, the junky lamb that had one crooked eye and three legs. And they brought the very best that they had because it represented that God was going to give the very best that he had. They had to examine it for four days to make sure. Can, you know, it, it's easy to get attached to pet. In the ancient plains of Shinar, an evil was born. The first world king, the prototype transhuman, the ultimate despot, Nimrod. In Babylon, the son of perdition devised the Shinar Directive, a plan to enslave humanity and make war against the God of Heaven. God's intervention at the Tower of Babel only delayed Nimrod's hellish plans as the powers of Mystery Babylon gather to create the new Tower of Babel and to prepare for the Son of Perdition's return, Heaven is issuing a clarion call to the remnant. The Shinar Directive will reveal the strategies of the enemy that will help you untangle yourself from them and become the victorious church. It is time for the remnant to wake up, discern the times, and be infused with Heaven's power to withstand the Shinar Directive by Dr. Michael Lake. Get your copy today at kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.